Thank you, Emily. Um, yeah. And I will share here as soon as you transfer over to me. We'll get started. Um, if you see the camera behind bird feeder cam up in case any birds start coming into the feeders while we're having our webinar today. Um, so we might switch to that if something cool happens, I uh, wanted to, to have it there. So that's why there's all the wires and the camera in the background, just in case, you know, big flock of Stellar's Jay come in and, and mob my peanuts or something like that. Um, so let me start the presentation here. Okay, hopefully we can all see a title screen that shows a cast and spinch eating a black oil sunflower seed out of a wire mesh tube feeder. Um, for those of you that are live, obviously we'll have some question and answer at the end. If you want to put your questions into the question or chat box, you know, while the presentation happens and you know, I can transition to them smoothly, we'll take them then. Otherwise we'll wait for a lot of them at the end. But if you wanted to throw in your location, where you're from, doesn't have to be exact, just general location so that at the end we can especially tailor answers to location specific questions, you know, that, that would be great. Um, because for me, I'm in the Rockies. So, you know, how things work for me in the Rockies, a little bit different than maybe if you live, you know, in the middle of the Great Plains. For instance, I have bears here, you might not. So uh, wanna throw your location in, that would be great. It'd be very, very helpful. A um, little bit about me. So my day job is not this, but is actually with a bird conservation organization um, that uh, I do real life on the ground bird research and bird conservation work. Um, here's a photo of me actually holding uh, probably a black chin hummingbird uh, that uh, I likely banded many years ago in uh, Portal, Arizona. Um, feeding, watching birds, enjoying birds and other wildlife is not just what I do for work, it's actually my hobby and my passion. So it's nice when those things go together and it uh, most days doesn't feel like you're working at all when they're kind of the exact same thing. Um, I do run Flocking Around, which is a bird information site. It's a little bit on the fun side, a little tongue in cheek. You know, the, the name kind of would indicate that it's a little bit on the, the maybe less serious side. So I try to have a lot of fun with it. Uh, so if you wanted to check it out, you are welcome to, and you can contact me through the site as well as then contact information will be up at the end of the presentation. So if you're watching the recorded version of this, because we will also have some watching the recorded version, contact information at the end. So if you have questions that didn't get answered during the course of the webinar, you can send them over to me and I will get back to you. Okay, so we're here because of feeding birds. And why do we feed birds? It, uh, it you know, for a personal standpoint, maybe some of us see birds because it makes us happy, makes us feel good. Um, you know, we really enjoy watching and, and uh, appreciating birds, you know, at a, at a very intimate distance, right? It's very close space. If I go to this feeder cam behind me, you know, you're gonna see my feeders are, are just out in uh, my side yard and I've got some more in my backyard um, and some out of my garden as well. So, you know, they're, they're all over the place. And uh, so why we do it? Well, it differs for all of us, um, but there are benefits to the, the feeding of birds. One of those is just supporting healthy bird populations. One of the biggest threats to birds right now is just habitat loss. And habitat loss means lack of nesting space and lack of food availability. So feeding birds can help to offset at least some of that in that you are you know, adding a supplementary food source so that birds can improve their, their body condition. So there's actually been, actually been studies that show bird feeding improves the body condition of birds that utilize feeders versus those same species when they're too far away from feeders or they're living in an environment with no feeders. What else does it do? Well, it actually, that, that happiness, that good feeling you get, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not just anecdotal. There's evidence that shows feeding birds and having birds in your neighborhood brings you joy and brings you greater mental and physical health. So having green spaces, having birds, it's, uh, it's good for all of us. And then having birds around, what does it do? Well, it can help with pest control management. For instance, I don't know if you can hear the chickadees through my microphone, but there are about four or five chickadees out on the feeders right now. They not only are eating the seed that are at my feeders, but during the course of a summer, 
they're feeding, you know, several thousand caterpillars and other insects to their chicks. And I have several nests around my home of just chickadees, as well as then there's gross beaks that live at my home, robins live at my home, and they're all eating insects and then feeding them to their chicks. And if they're multiple, you know, multiple clutches, multiple broods, a lot of chicks, that's a lot of insects then that those birds are helping to keep under control for me, um, preventing me from having to do as much. Although the box elder bugs just get out of hand here, no matter what I do, it doesn't matter how many birds I have around, they just can't keep up with those box elder bugs. They get everywhere. So not only is feeding birds helpful to birds, but there are other things we can do at our homes that supplement the supplementary food, which is bird feeding, planting native gardens. So planting a native garden doesn't take the place of offering, you know, extra supplemental food, but it, it can, you know, work in cohesion with feeding birds. So planting native plants provides nesting space and additional food sources for birds that are harder to provide by feeding birds. For instance, living wild native insects. That's not something we can really provide as part of our bird feeding experience. So having native plants that host native insects, it's a great way to help birds and then supplement your bird feeding. You have more native habitat around your bird feeders, then you're gonna have more birds that can nest around there and that feel sheltered in those areas. Other things we can do, keep cats indoors. It's a pretty easy one. Cats after habitat loss, cats are the number two uh, cause of decline in native bird populations. Treating windows. Windows are what, top four or five reasons in, in bird population loss. And you know, since, uh, since the 1970s, we've lost 30% of our North American bird populations. Um, There's a big study that came out 2019, something like that, that, that talks about how many birds we've lost since the 1970s. Um, and it's pretty significant. And so those three steps right there will help a lot um, and can help just, and maybe, you know, might not in the Grand scheme of things, just one person planting, you know, a native plant garden in their yard might not uh, seem like enough to boost, but it will certainly help your local bird population and take some of the pressure off of them. So things to consider. Um, other things we can do, avoid pesticide use. Um, like I said, birds eat pests. So poisoning the pests can hurt your birds, especially those in your local population. Um, and another one, drinking shade grown coffee. Our birds that summer here, breed here, they have to winter somewhere. Well, a lot of that habitat in Central and South America is disappearing because of coffee. Coffee is becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. We're not drinking less coffee every year, we're drinking a lot more of it. So that wintering habitat is starting to disappear. So in order to support birds here, we need to support good habitat down there. And one way is drinking Smithsonian certified bird-friendly coffee, shade-grown coffee, these are all grown in a way that promotes healthier uh, habitat, where coffee and habitat can go hand in hand, where it's not clear cutting forest. Instead, the coffee is grown in the shade underneath the mature trees. And there's certain uh, stipulations that they have to follow in order to, to meet the certification requirements. So what are the potential pitfalls of bird feeding? Well, if you, practice your ethics and your safety, hopefully very few, um, but there are potential issues if you're not doing things, you know, in the best manners that you can. Um, those potential issues include disease. You can see the, the image here. Uh, this is a Cassin's finch that is suffering from what's often referred to as house finch eye disease or conjunctivitis. Um, so we'll get into cleaning a little bit later on, but not cleaning feeders can be a big contributor to this and other disease. Uh, pests, and whether you consider a pest just a mouse that comes in at night, you know, and uh, cleans up the seed that's fallen to the ground, or you consider a pest, you know, a big 300 pound black bear that uh, comes into your yard and rips down all of your feeders and breaks everything. Whatever it is, you know, it can be a potential issue that you might face with feeding birds. So something to consider is how can you, you know, keep things in a manner that uh, prevents that negative interaction with those pests. And then you can attract other wildlife that maybe aren't pest-like, but they could cause, it could cause issues for you or your neighbors. You know, if you get too many deer in your yard because they're cleaning up the seed on the ground and then they're pooping in your neighbor's yard or something like that, 
can create potential conflict for you and your neighbors. Um, so things to consider when feeding birds and, and providing a supplementary food source. Okay, so let's jump into feeder types. Um, and again, if you have questions at any point, you can just slow down, uh, just make sure to throw them, oops, in the chat there, go back. There we go. Okay. So, feeder types. And we're going to talk about feeder types, then food types, and then matching feeder to food, and then matching feeder and food to birds, because all of those are interconnected and they all kind of depend on each other. Um, so, feeder types you might see if you, you know, if you go down to your local store and, you know, go into the bird feeder section to buy a bird feeder, what might you see? Well, you might see a platform, which is a flat feeder very much just like the name suggests. Usually they hang, sometimes they mount on top of a pole. It's just a flat with a lip and the seed goes inside of it and you can put just about any seed in it you want. Um, hoppers are kind of like a modified platform in that they have a roof and oftentimes a side so that they can hold more seed. Um, and with these, it, you know, you'll want to consider your space and, and your time availability to contribute to these. Because like a platform feeder will run out very quickly because a lot of birds can come in, sit on it and clean it out and they don't hold as much seed as say a hopper, which can hold more. So if you can't fill every day, well then that seed can be slowly distributed as the birds come in. Tube feeders, uh, you saw the, the one earlier in the presentation, the title slide, where it's just as the name suggests, it's a long tube. It can be made of plastic with ports, or it can be made of wire mesh, where the seeds can fall out the, the holes on the side. A uh, lot of varieties to all of these. So there's no single instance of this is exactly what this is they can have a significant amount of variety to them. Nectar feeders, not just for hummingbirds, you'll see nectar feeders for orioles as well as hummingbirds. Um, usually orioles are generally colored orange, you know, because orioles will come into actual oranges and then hummingbirds are generally colored red because hummingbirds are attracted to the color red. Suet feeders can uh, come in something like this cage. You can see this white-breasted nuthatch is sitting on this cage where there's some suet inside of it. It can look like that or, it can look like an actual log and you put uh, you either take the suet and smoosh it up yourself and shove it into the plugs or you can buy plugs that fit the suet logs and then it just looks like a natural log hanging there with suet plugs in it. So uh, suet feeders can look very different just like all of these, a lot of varieties that can exist. And then there are ground feeders which are kind of modified platform feeders or some people just throw the food out on the ground and let the birds find it in their yard on their own. What feed types are there? Uh, a lot. <laughs> and this isn't even going to cover all of them, but this will cover the major ones that you'll see uh, on most shelves at your local retailers. So the major ones we have, black hole sunflower seed, striped sunflower seed. There is a difference between them and the birds that prefer them. So, uh, you know, you want to do some digging as to, to what, you know, your birds might prefer. Though I will say black hole sunflower seed is, is oftentimes just, if you want to attract a very wide variety of birds it's going to be you know top of the list because a lot of birds love black hole sunflower seed there's suet which is a fat based you know brick usually or a plug or it can come in different shapes um, but suet is just fat and then some other food items usually integrated within the fat block there's millet milo which are small round seeds one's white one's red generally there's niger which um niger is actually a, a term that is uh, trademarked by WBFI um, and it's called Niger because there was some confusion about what the seed was early on when uh, WBFI coined that term um, and so it, it kind of helps to indicate what the seed is. It's not actually thistle seed so if you hear to it hear it referred to as thistle it's not actually thistle. It's, uh, it's a member of the aster family which are the the sunflowers, the daisies, things like that. It's a member of that family. And so it's a small seed. And what you see is not the seed itself. It's still a shell. That's right. That tiny little Niger seed is actually inside of that little black thing you're looking at. That's the shell. And then there's still a seed inside. So Niger can still produce little shells that, that fall down to the ground um, and, and create, you know, some, uh, some shell overflow on the ground. When you have lots of birds eating it, you've got thousands of finches coming and eating it. They'll leave a mess. Um, there's mealworms, there's corn, there's fruit, 
Uh, sometimes fruit can be just as simple as you go to your grocery store, you buy an orange, you slice it up into halves and you nail it to a tree and the Orioles come in and eat it to, you know, there are a lot of uh, organizations that provide dried fruit so that it lasts longer sitting in a feeder. You know, fresh fruit will go bad a lot faster. Peanuts, peanuts are a big favorite of a lot of animals out there, um, in shell, out of shell. Sometimes they'll be broken up into smaller pieces. You'll find them in a lot of varieties. Oats, safflower. Safflower is often referred to kind of as a sunflower alternative because certain birds prefer it less and certain mammals prefer it less. And then obviously sugar water, nectar, whatever you want to refer to it as. Um, and there's another one called canary seed that's oftentimes mixed with Niger and what's called a finch food or something like that. Um, if you want to know what they look like, this uh, image is taken from WBFI's resources page. So you can go check it out and view it a little bit uh, higher quality possibly there. Um, but uh, this is a, an example of just a handful of these and what they look like. Um, and so, you know, you'll see seed varieties that mix a lot of these together. Oftentimes, Canary and Niger will mix, or you'll see uh, Milo, Millet, and sun, Black Oil Sunflower mixed, or Peanuts and Black Oil Sunflower with maybe uh, some dried fruit. Again, varieties of them, depending on the types of birds you're trying to attract. And oftentimes, they're, you know, connoted on the bag. You know, this is, you know, for this kind. You'll see it as finch food, or maybe it'll be cardinal food, or blue jay food, depending on you know, what the, the main ingredient might be. With bird feeding, one thing you don't want to forget is the water. So birds, uh, you know, they can find food on their own, yes, and, and, and that's all great. Um, but oftentimes, especially in years like this, where much of the U.S. is in a drought, water can be something that's a lot harder to find, especially clean, fresh water. And, you know, a lot of times you'll see birds bathing in water on the sides of the roads. Well, you have to worry about, uh, you know, non-point, source pollution that uh, is in that water. You know, are there hydrocarbons in that water from cars leaking oil onto the road or, or just the chemicals that are used to make the road? And so providing clean, fresh water is critical to birds. Um, you can do it through a bird bath, uh, a bird drip. That's what this is. This is my backyard bird drip. You can see it's actually just a large uh, pot under tray, you know, for catching water uh, when you've got your planted pots. I got a really, really big one. I put big stones in it so that birds can't ever drown. It's pretty shallow anyway, but small birds especially. Um, and then I have a little water drip that drips frequently. The movement of water is actually what attracts birds oftentimes to water. So having a little bit of movement, if you're not seeing birds coming into your water, it can really help because they see the movement and they come in. Um, if you live in cold places, then uh, you know thinking of something that keeps the water warm can be helpful. Um, and, you know, if you don't live in a cold place, you can use something like a fountain or a bubbler maybe uh, that uh, just helps to, to keep the water, you know, moving at some level. Uh, that movement, though, really important if you want the birds to find your water quickly. And uh, the, the drips, they really seem to like the drips. They'll even sit on the drip and, and drink directly out of the drip. Or sometimes they'll sit under the drip and bathe in it, especially hummingbirds. Hummingbirds like really shallow water that uh, they can bathe in because too much water is... Uh, not, not great for hummingbirds, they don't, they don't like that, they're too small. Okay, so we talked about feeder types, food types. Now let's match the feed to the feeders. Um, so black oil sunflower, one of the most common and generally you know, uh, used food types on the market. It goes with almost every feeder type. Um, so you can use it on a platform feeder which uh, that's, that's what I have uh, out back here. If I turn on the, the bird feeder webcam, we'll, we'll see the, the feeders out back. I've got uh, several tubes and a platform, and I have them all filled with just black oil sunflower seed at the moment, although the platform feeder did have peanuts in it earlier. Those jays came in and took it all pretty quick. Um, so black oil sunflower seed can go in that. If you're gonna put it in a mesh feeder or a tube feeder, you have to make sure the holes are big enough for the seed to come out of them. Something to consider because if you put it you know, if you put black oil sunflower seed in a Niger feeder or a finch feeder, it will not fit out the holes, the birds will not pull it out, and they will stop using it. Um, some tube mesh feeders look like they would be big enough for peanuts to pass through them, but only if the peanuts are crushed up. So really consider, you know, does the size of the seed fit through the size of the hole? Very important. Um, and then, you know, some people just scatter them on the ground, or, or you can put them in a big hopper feeder. Um, Niger generally goes with 
a Niger specific feeder. They have really small holes, either they're small ports or small mesh holes, um, or sometimes you'll see them used with, uh, it's a cloth sock and it's just called a thistle sock or a Niger sock, depending on who makes it. Suet pretty much only goes with suet feeders. I've seen people just nail it to trees or set it out, but the thing is a lot of animals, especially in wintertime, they just want that fat. And I'll, I'll see a deer come in and just grab a suet cake and carry it off. Yes, a deer, just grabbing a whole block of suet fat and carrying it off to eat it. So do consider that uh, usually cages work really well because uh, you know they stop something like a deer from carrying it off. Uh, although things like squirrels can still figure out how to use a suet cage. So you know there's, there's other options out there. There's different types of suet cages. Some that are really big for big woodpeckers, some that only do upside down, you know, for nut hatches and woodpeckers to, to use them without maybe letting starlings or grackles using suet feeders because other birds will use suet feeders. As you can see in this image, that is no woodpecker on that suet cage. Other birds will come in to suet feeders. So, uh, you know, thinking about if you're getting overwhelmed with certain species using your suet, what kind of suet feeder could you use to deter that kind of activity? Nectar goes with hummingbird feeders, oriole feeders, you'll see them for both. Um, and uh, you know, there's certain recipes that are, are very distinct on, on how to make those. You can also buy some out there, some that are powder that are pre-made. We do not need red dye in our hummingbird or oriole food. Um, we are unsure of what those dyes could do to birds. So it's better to just avoid using ingredients that are unnecessary because the feeder usually is colorful enough to attract them. Okay, let's match the feed and the bird now. So black oil sunflower seed, I said it's preferred by a lot of birds, that's the truth. Just about anything you could imagine would come in and eat some black oil sunflower seed or you know, sunflower that's been you know, hulled and crushed up. Sometimes smaller build birds can't eat a black oil sunflower seed as a whole seed, they can't crack it open as easily. So they'll wait until there's scraps of it on the ground and they'll clean up. Um, but finches, chickadees, big finches especially, but little finches will eat black oil sunflower seed. Chickadees, grosbeaks, cardinals, blue jays, just about anything you can imagine, blackbirds, they will eat black oil sunflower seed. That's why it's, it's just so frequently used because a lot of birds will take advantage of it. Um, Niger is preferred by smaller build birds. So small finches, gold finches, pine siskins, there's a lot of species of goldfinches, so I'm talking American goldfinch, lesser goldfinch, Lawrence's goldfinch. All will prefer that, pine siskins. Other small finches will use it too, especially if there's not a lot of other food sources. Um, red poles, if you like red poles, red poles will eat Niger, it's one of their favorites. So the smaller build finches and small build sparrows will eat Niger. Like this dark-eyed junco, they will eat the Niger, not out of the Niger feeder, they wait till it falls to the ground and then they'll eat the seed, they'll crack it open and, and eat the seed that way. Small build finches, Lincoln sparrows, song sparrows, they'll also eat Niger. You'll have some big birds that will also swarm to Niger if there is no other food out. So uh, if you're only feeding Niger, that is something you have to worry about is the big birds then will keep the little birds away from the Niger food. Something to consider. Um, suet, usually suet is preferred by nuthatches and woodpeckers, although I have seen a wide variety of birds uh, not just birds that some people don't like, like grackles and starlings, but I've seen juncos sitting on a suet feeder eating it, orioles, tanagers, um, grosbeaks, uh, jays, I, just about anything you can imagine. If a late snowstorm comes in or something like that, or it's bad weather, and they need that boost of fat, those calories, they will go and they will get on that suet and they will eat it. Um, so having you know uh, a supplementary suet block for especially the cold months of the year, you can really up your variety of birds that are coming in to visit. Nectar, hummingbirds, orioles, other birds will eat it. You gotta be careful. Woodpeckers will come in and drill out the holes to access the nectar. I've seen, I've seen woodpeckers come in and they'll, they'll break the hole open larger so they can go in and they can drink it. I think I actually have a photo of, uh, was it a uh, uh, Gila woodpecker sitting on a feeder and you can see the tongue going down. Woodpeckers have really long tongues if you didn't know. And the tongue goes all the way down into the nectar and it's lapping up the nectar with its tongue. Um, Sapsuckers will do it too. Sapsuckers actually have tongues built for helping to lap up sugary substances. So some other birds will use nectar feeders, something to consider. Uh, you know, if you're gonna put it out, you might have other things visiting it than what you intended. So just be cognizant of that. Peanuts, loved by jays. 
crows, ravens, if you, if you like those, you know, really big uh, charismatic birds like that, peanuts are beloved by the jays. If you have questions about specific birds and how to attract them, you can either save them for the end or you can get them in the, the question box now and that way we'll get to them at the end so you don't forget it. Because um, we'll, we'll go over how to attract just about anything we could hope to attract. And now, not all birds will be attracted to feeders, which is where water comes in because water then can be something that attracts all birds because all birds need water. All right, so matching the feeder to the bird. So blue jays love peanuts, but blue jays can't always land on small feeders. So putting you know small crushed peanuts on a really small feeder might be very difficult for a blue jay to access it. Now, they will try and they're smart enough, they'll often figure it out, but matching your feeder to your bird is important as well. Um, large birds like platforms because they're large. They want to have that space to spread out, to sit, um, and to collect food, uh, especially jays, they'll come in and they'll eat several pieces of food while sitting at the feeder. And so they really want that space to be able to do that. They don't like having, you know, short stubby perches. They want to be able to sit down on the feeder and feel solid. So large feeders, large birds. Um, now that's not to say they won't use smaller feeders again, but just generally, you know, doves will sit in a platform feeder but they rarely will sit on a tube feeder. Smaller birds that, you know, they, they can cling to the side of a mesh feeder, chickadees, siskins, you know, other small finches, things that can cling, nut hatches. They'll use small mesh tube feeders because they are, it's a lot easier for them just to cling to the side, grab a seed and fly off. So think about that, you know, with the birds you wanna get, that would maybe stop larger birds from using that feeder, but still allow the smaller birds to come in and feed at it. So if you're trying to stop larger birds from using it, but you want small birds, you know, the tube wire mesh feeders can, can do that. So matching it to what you want and also preventing what you don't want, that's a great way to do it. Um, hummingbirds prefer, you know, red feeders with small ports. If you use something that has, you know, a yellow flower on, on the port, might also attract other things that you don't want, bees, wasps. Not to say that not using yellow or white flowers on a red feeder won't attract that, but generally if you just use a red feeder with a bunch of small red holes, hummingbirds will come into that and it might minimize how many uh, less desirable insects at the feeder. While those insects are great in other scenarios, maybe you don't want to match your feeder uh, that you'll get. Wasps, you know, I, I know some of us aren't fans of wasps, but they're also really good pest control. So you don't want to match your feeder, but maybe you want them in your garden helping to, to clean up on caterpillars. Okay, so we talked feeders food, uh, matching those to the birds that you want. Now thinking about where are you gonna place your feeders? Now, if you live in an apartment, um, you may want to look at some window platform feeders. A lot of companies make ones that attach to windows because you know, if you don't have a yard space or a hanging space, it's a lot harder to, you know, to put feeders in an enjoyable place. Um, putting feeders directly on windows is actually recommended as one of the safer ways to prevent window strikes from birds because they come into the feeder and then they know they can't go that way anymore. So generally you wanna keep your, your feeders either uh, three feet, less than three feet from your windows or 30 feet, greater than 30 feet. Those are the, the parameters usually that we place to minimize bird window collisions that are due to feeders. Because when you have feeders, you can attract more birds, which can lead to window strikes. So something like that. And we'll talk about window treatment uh, in a bit. So if you live in an apartment, that might be the route you have to go. If you don't, um, you want to place your feeders in areas that are safe, meaning they're, they're quiet. So if your yard is up next to a yard where they have a really loud dog or something like that, maybe put it on the other side of the yard, you know, move it away from the area where there's going to be a lot of noise and disturbance because the birds will not appreciate that as much. They want to be protected. So areas where they can go into a tree if a predator comes through, and we'll talk about predators towards the end of this presentation. Um, if you don't have that, you might have to build the protection. What do I mean by that? Uh, I build up a uh, big, just I, when I have fallen branches, I put them in a big brush pile and I have these big brush piles that are underneath my feeders that the food can fall into. And then smaller birds like to go in there, especially the ground birds, juncos, towhees, things like that. They go in there and then they help clean up the food there. Now I will say, if you build brush piles and you put your feeders above them, it is a little bit of a nightmare to clean out from underneath them because you got to move the brush pile and then you got to clear out all the fallen food, you know, after it's been out for too long, um, which we'll talk about cleaning your feeders in a bit. 
So you do have to take that into consideration. You don't have to put it directly on your feeders, but put it nearby so birds have a place to go into and hide in the case of a predator or a suspected predator. Because a lot of times birds will think they saw something or hear something, and so they'll they'll seek cover. So if you don't have big conifers or you know big deciduous trees that they can go and hide into, big bushes, something like building your own out of brush piles can be very beneficial. Um, you want to place them in a place where you can enjoy them. Uh, you know, you don't want your feeders out where, where you can't see them. So you want them to be in a place where, you know, maybe you can look out your window and enjoy them, or maybe you sit on your back porch and, you know, they're out where you can see them. So place them in a place that's, you know, enjoyable. Because part of it is you want to have that intimate distance with these birds where, you know, it makes the, the enjoyment a lot, a lot greater. Um, and then we already kind of talked about the windows when I was talking about apartments and using feeders at apartments. But consider where your windows are, not only to see out of, but also preventing window strikes. And again, we'll talk about some uh, ways to prevent window strikes when your feeders can't lie within that 30 to three foot distance. You know, if it lies in between those two spots, you wanna find that happy medium. Well, you can treat your windows to prevent that from happening. Um, other things you can do to help boost your feeder numbers, plant feeders. And by planting feeders, I mean planting plants that act as bird feeders. So having native flowers, near hummingbird feeders can mean there's not too much competition at the feeder so that the hummingbirds can constantly move and cycle through. But also, you know, if you have native flowers out and you don't have your hummingbird feeder out yet because you're like, oh, I don't know if the hummingbirds are in yet. I don't want to put out my hummingbird feeder until I see a hummingbird. Well, if you have native flowers, they're going to come in. And once you see them at the, at the flowers, then you know, OK, now it's time to put out my hummingbird feeder. Um, so they can be a great signal, you know, time to put out the feeders. So planting flowers, you know, planting uh, bushes, planting berry producing trees, uh, you know, not all birds are going to eat seeds. So like attracting robins, for instance, planting trees that produce fall berries, critical. My yard's full of choke cherry. And right now the robins are going crazy for the choke cherry. Um, so having that, and then actually what I do, because I want to see the robins in the feeder sometimes, I'll take some of the choke cherries off and put them in the feeder, and then the robins will actually come into the feeder occasionally, but only because I'm using the, the food that they want on the trees and putting it into my feeders. So consider complementing your feeders with plants. Um, also, the I mentioned earlier the insects, you, you definitely want to consider, um, you know, some birds in the summertime, they're going to switch to an insect heavy diet. So planting plants that support native insects because Chicks, baby birds, nestlings, they need insects. Protein, vitamins, minerals, calcium, things like that. It's a critical part. They might get supplemented with seed. There are some birds that really only eat plant seed. You know, your uh, uh, goldfinch, for instance, mostly is, it doesn't really eat a lot of insect matter, even when it has chicks. Um, but a lot of other birds switch to insects. So supporting your feeders with plants, native plants that support native insects, it's a great way to just make those two support each other. Okay. It doesn't have to be one or the other. You can make them uh, to work in concert. Um, okay, now we get into the ethics. So if you're going to have feeders, you got to clean your feeders. Um, you you got you to gotta change the food. You got to keep up with it. You got to clean it. Um, the seed, even though it's seed, it goes bad. If it gets wet, uh, especially if it's at the bottom of the feeder, just getting compounded on constantly, it will go bad. So you need to change your seed and your feed. Suet, if it's too hot, can melt um, and, and make a mess everywhere. Um, so change your feed every so often. Usually once per week is, is a good way then also to prevent your feeders from getting too dirty because then they get compacted with all the seed parts. So changing your food frequently enough, especially if it's not getting eaten that quickly, it's a great way to you know prevent disease spreading at feeders, um, but also giving out bad food to uh, our feathered friends. So something to consider, um, you know, especially if you're gonna use fruit, you're gonna have to change your fruit a lot more often. Nectar, nectar can mold on a 95 degree day in a day. So you have to consider your temperature as well. Something like nectar needs to be changed every two days if it's really, really hot. All things to consider if you're gonna feed birds, what is your availability to commit to it? Um, so, you know, if you're like, well, I can't change nectar every two days, maybe I need to only feed this type of feed during this time of year. You know, consider that when you're making your decisions about what you want to feed and what you want to attract. 
cleaning our feeders. You gotta clean your feeders. You just, you gotta have clean feeders. Um, it doesn't have to be an everyday chore, uh, but you do need to clean them uh, at least every other week. Um, and when we say clean, that means you want to scrub them with soap and water, um, and then you want to soak them in a diluted bleach solution, uh, one to nine, and we'll, we'll talk, we'll get more in depth about how to do it here in a bit. Um, but why do we wanna do it? Because disease can spread at feeders. We're congregating birds, we're, you know, we're encouraging them to come into close contact, and so disease can spread. Spoiled food can spread, so changing your food, but also then old food that's still clung to the sides of your feeders, getting that out of the way, also critical. Cleaning your feeders also helps maintain the life of them. You know, they get built up with crust and then certain parts don't work the way they should. So keeping up on cleaning your feeders also is gonna just help extend the longevity of your feeders. So all important reasons to make sure to stay on top of cleaning your feeders. One suggestion I can make is having one or two backup sets of feeders so that if you're, you know, if you can't clean them all in one day, you can cycle through. Okay, I'm gonna put out the clean backup feeders well, I take down the other feeders and clean them because you have to let them air dry. So it's gonna take a little bit. So having an alternate set of feeders to do a swap out. That's, that's what I do um, because I like to soak mine in a tub and then I like to let them air dry out in the sun. So having a backup set of feeders, very, very helpful. <clears throat> okay, so how do we do it? First, take them apart. Um, most feeders, you know, they, they might have one or two parts, maybe more, maybe less, you know, something like a simple suet cage it's just a simple suet cage. Um, but if they do come apart, take the moving parts apart because you know things can get stuck down the nooks and the crannies and the cracks and it can be a real nightmare if you don't get them you know, as fully taken apart as possible. Then you want to remove the visible debris with hot soapy water. You're gonna wanna, and don't use your dish sponge. You know, Have your own like bird feeding dish sponge, okay? Your feeder sponge. Don't use the sponge you use to clean your, your actual dishes with. And I, I actually, I have two sets of dish gloves. One set of dish gloves for doing my dishes, one set of dish gloves that are for the bird feeders. The black ones, I've got, I've got these black dish gloves. They're for the bird feeders. I know don't touch anything else with the black dish gloves because, you know, birds can, can uh, host diseases that uh, could potentially be harmful to humans, make us sick. So wearing gloves, very, very good idea. Um, and, uh, and keeping things separate, having things separate. Um, and I've got some, some tips on how to do that. So remove the visible debris. Make sure you can see the feeder, okay? Because the bleach cannot get to all parts of the feeder that's exposed to the birds unless it is clear of debris. Uh, there was a study on this. This is the effective way to do it to minimize disease spread. Clean the debris and then soak it. One part bleach, nine parts water. So for instance, if you wanna soak it in a five gallon bucket, It'd be what, a half a gallon, something like that. Um, so a half gallon of bleach to five gallons of water, if you did it in that. You can find ratio calculators online if math isn't your, your favorite thing. If I did that math wrong, then my, clearly math's not my favorite thing. So something to consider, but it's one to nine and, and you know, get you a big tub and just do it in the tub, just measure out your water. It doesn't have to be perfect, you know, just as close to accurate as possible so that we can really help to minimize disease spread. When you're drying the feeders, they need to be completely dry before you put food back in. Otherwise, you know, the seed being exposed, exposed to moisture can cause the seed to go bad, okay? Um, so really make sure you allow them to dry. Don't use a heater or dryer because you can warp your feeder. Many of them are plastic. So using heat uh, can actually be really bad on the feeders and cause them to, you know, age prematurely, crack, things like that. So just let them air dry. Just let them take their time and air dry. That's where having the second set of feeders comes into play and really helps out. Things to consider. Where you're gonna clean your feeders, have a clean prep area, okay? Don't, uh, you know, don't do it on the counter where you just chopped up a bunch of uh, chicken or something like that, right? That would be a very bad idea. Uh, not great cross-contamination. I also generally don't recommend cleaning it on your kitchen counter where you prepare food. Um, but if you're gonna do that, clean really well before and clean even better after using a bleach solution, okay? Um, but if you're gonna, you know, share those spaces. Some places will tell you to use a dishwasher. I, I'm not a fan of that. Um, that's, that's where you put your food. Now it should disinfect it every time, you know, with hot water being blasted and soap and if you use bleach or anything like that, but still it's not my favorite. I prefer to do it by hand and then just let them soak. Um, I also just think it goes faster and 
Again, the heat drying aspect of a dishwasher could warp your feeders. So something to consider. I'm not saying don't do it. You need to take into consideration you know, your own situation, but it's not my personal favorite to use a dishwasher. Anytime you're dealing with the feeders, you're gonna to wanna to wear gloves. Um, again, potential chance of disease exposure, so minimize it. It's not a huge risk. It's a very minimal risk, in fact, but no point in you know, exposing yourself to something you don't need. Um, and then again, reiterating, clean the area when you're done. Even if it's not an area where you prep food, you still should clean up after you're done, make it nice and clean. Um, some things that I do, I actually have a false sink. It's like a big tub that has a drain in the bottom that I use for the scrubbing, you know, so I put hot water and soap in it. I'll scrub the feeders in that and then set them into the uh, the bleach bin. And then I'll have a, a fresh water bucket and I dip them in that a bunch of times to rinse off, you know, any excess diluted bleach water and then set them out to dry. So I have a little, you know, uh, assembly line of cleaning bird feeders that I use. And so I have a, a separate sink thing. And then when I'm done with the sink thing, I can just turn the bottom and it all drains out. Um, make sure you're not, you know, draining that anywhere that, uh, you know, if you have pets or something like that, they could try to drink it up because you know you could potentially expose them to something too. So consider where you're going to dump that out at. Um, last thing with cleaning feeders, look down. That's right, look under the feeders because there's a bunch of stuff down there. Um, get that fallen seed or the seed holes. You might want to get it, you know, up as well. And and there also might be feces down there. So if you can, rake it, sweep it. Uh, you know, whatever you can do to help catch it up and get it out of there, it's useful. Some people put catch trays underneath their feeders that are bigger than the feeder itself. So there's the feeder and then there's a big tray underneath and it catches a lot of the fallen seed. It doesn't catch everything, but it catches a lot. They will use those then to help minimize the cleanup under the feeders. That's fine. Uh, just, you know, and, and it doesn't have to be as regularly, but birds will feed down there as well. So they could be exposed to something negative down there. If you're gonna put out hummingbird feeders, they require extra care. That's all there is to it. Um, hummingbird feeders, you know, one of the things I recommend is using smaller feeders so that either the food runs out um, or, you know, or you're not wasting that much, that much nectar, you know, if it's gonna mold and go bad if you're not changing it frequently enough. Um, and it forces you to have to fill it more frequently, which then offers less chance for mold to grow because it's running out faster. So I use really small hummingbird feeders um, but you have to change it every two to five days. Even if it's not that hot, five days, you can start to see mold growing and mold can be a quick killer of a hummingbird. So keeping up on changing the nectar and cleaning. And so every time you change the nectar, you're gonna wanna clean. You don't need to use bleach or vinegar or anything like that to clean these unless you've got a really bad mold situation. Um, but if you're keeping up on it, hopefully that's not happening. Just soap and hot water, give them a scrub out, and then uh, let them dry. Rinse them out really good so you don't have soap mixed in with your uh, nectar solution, obviously. Um, and then dry them, hang them back out. Pretty easy there. Uh, try not to let hummingbird nectar freeze too. Um, it's, it's, you know, if it's going to be freezing at night, maybe bring them inside so that uh, overnight they don't freeze and then you can hang them in the morning. And the hummingbirds will appreciate having warm food and a warm feeder instead of frozen nectar. Uh, they're not fans of popsicles. So don't do the popsicle. If you're gonna put out water, it's gotta be changed frequently. I say every day, there's some lax there, but you know, still don't let it build up too much, uh, whether it's, you know, this buildup of algae or buildup of feces in the water, because a lot of birds, they get in the water, what's the first thing they do, they poop. Just the way it is. So changing your water frequently, um, using, you know, if you use a really shallow dish, it's gonna either evaporate or be sloshed out by the birds at the end of the day anyway, if it's not on a drip system or something. Um, so it's really easy. And you know, filling water is as simple as just throw it over your shoulder and pour a new pitcher in and you're done. It can be that simple if you just have a, a basic bird bath. Um, avoiding porous materials prevents you know, things from growing in those pores. So you know, using uh, something like uh, maybe a ceramic or, or metal or something like that where there's not pores, can help to minimize algae growth and other bacterial growths. Moving water can help with stagnation, a drip system, a bubbler, a fountain, things like that. And if you're gonna use something that moves the water, using a filtration system is a great and easy way to help keep it cleaner longer, and then you don't have to change your water quite as frequently. Um, if you put it under things like trees, well then the water will fill, obviously with leaves, especially if the leaves are falling or, or things are falling off the trees, you know, seeds, nuts, whatever it is. Um, so something to consider, you know, you, 
sometimes putting it next to trees will encourage birds to come in because they like the shelter there, but then you might also have to clean it out more frequently. You know, pros and cons, something to think about. Okay, if you're gonna put out feeders, here's an expectation. Expect predators. You are drawing in birds. Well, when you draw in prey species, guess what follows? The predators. So if you're gonna put out feeders, expect it to happen and don't interfere with it. Don't try to chase the predator bird off. Now, obviously, if there's a cat coming into your feeder, it's a very different thing. Cats are not native. Birds are not adapted to dealing with cats in this country, okay? So, you know, the whole argument, well, it's a wild animal, it's just a cat being a cat. Well, no, birds here haven't adapted to that yet, okay? It's, it's not something that they're used to. It's not a predator they're used to. See, so it's not something you can just simply, ah, oh, it's just a cat being a cat. No, the birds don't understand that. However, these birds do have a way for looking out and avoiding avian predators like this Cooper's hawk. So expect predators coming to your feeders. If it happens, it happens, and they will haunt your feeders for a few weeks. The birds will stop coming in for a while, and then the predators move on, and then the birds come back. Or the birds might change their schedule up while the predator's in the area. The predator might stick around for a while. It might not. It really just depends. But predators will come in. Expect it. It's just part of it. If you don't want that to happen, when you see one, stop feeding for a while. Let the birds disperse. Predator will move on. Put the food back out. Okay? But it's going to happen. It's gonna happen. It's, it's just something to expect as part of this. Uh, another expectation. If you're gonna watch out your windows, birds are gonna fly into your windows. If you don't do something to prevent it, even, even if you use the three and 30 foot rules, you're still gonna have a bird collision with your window. So what you're seeing here, this is the view out my, the window that's behind me right now where the camera's out looking. Those are the feeders that are up right now. Um, so looking out there, what you can actually see is there's like this cloudy substance on this image, that cloudy substance, that's my window treatment. Um, and so I took the picture through the hole because I, I have it in a cross thatching pattern so that the birds can see there's something there. It's not just a reflection because that clear tape breaks up the pattern. And there's a lot of treatments out there. Um, everything from you know using the, the, the uh, window tape to window decals to you can use a uh, window chalk and just draw patterns in the chalk Try not to leave anything more than a three or four inch hole at most. You probably want to be closer to two inches to prevent all bird collisions, or at least 95 to 99%. Two inch holes on your window, okay? Um, but the tape allows you still, you can see, I can see through the tape and see there's stuff out there, even if it's slightly, you know, askew or blurry because of it. But it helps to cut down on window collisions. You can also, there's like window chalk spray. I've used that on some of my bigger windows. Um, it's not my favorite, but it's a nice, cheap, and effective way to quickly cover a big picture window if you don't want to have to buy a lot of the decal stuff. Um, okay, what else can you expect? Even if you keep your feeders completely clean and perfect, your neighbors might not, okay? Um, you're gonna get birds that come in diseased. That's just, it's just gonna happen, especially, again, if you have neighbors who aren't keeping up. You can talk to your neighbors, you can ask them to keep them clean, you can ask them to stop using certain types of feeders that can help spread certain diseases. Doesn't matter. You're gonna get birds in that are gonna have diseases because when we're congregating birds, it's going to happen. So um, you can expect it to happen. And if you keep up on your cleaning, at least you won't be part of the problem in helping to spread it. So you can really minimize it by keeping your feeders cleaner. Now, if you have diseases that are, are occurring at your feeders, sometimes they're easy to see, sometimes they're not. Sometimes you might just be notified by your local wildlife agency, hey, this is happening in our state. Up the amount that you're cleaning your feeders. Instead of every other week, you might have to go to every week. If you've got a really bad outbreak and you wanna keep feeding, up it even more, maybe every day, every other day. Keep up on your cleaning. Maybe minimize the number of feeders you have up so that you can clean them a lot more easily and you can keep rotating feeders in and out. So you constantly have clean feeders out only, all right? Some of the feeder diseases that we experience, uh, Salmonellosis, um, conjunctivitis, uh, the highly pathogenic avian influenza, um, avian pox, all things that can, can arrive, usually they come in waves, and then they're gone except for house finch eye disease. House finch eye disease occurs all year in a variety of species, mostly finches, but it can occur in other birds as well. So um, house finch eye disease is one that if you see it at your feeders, automatically take them down, clean them, and then you can hang them back up if you want. Certain feeders can 
uh, promote the spread of certain diseases more. Uh, so salmonella spreads oftentimes at platform feeders more because of sometimes birds will poop in the platform, something to consider. Uh, conjunctivitis spread at port feeders because conjunctivitis spreads that house fungi disease through contact with the infected eye and the juices from it. So a port feeder, the bird sticks their head into the port and then smears that bacteria all over the port. And so, you know, if you have birds with house finch eye disease, switching to a non-port feeder uh, can be beneficial. You're going to get unwanted pests, you know, things you might consider pests. Maybe your neighbors love to feed them, whatever it is. We're going to save that for a different webinar. So uh, I think that's week three or four where we're going to talk about preventing unwanted guests at your feeder, whether it's raccoons, squirrels, bears, whatever it is. We'll talk about ways to uh, help deter and mitigate against, you know, furry friends at feeders, because many of the times we don't want that. Um, before we get to questions here, resources. A uh, great resource out there, feederwatch.org, uh, put together by several conservation groups, bird conservation groups. So check out feederwatch.org. It has a lot more helpful information, um, as well as ways to participate in community science around your bird feeders contributing you know, to, to research and understanding of bird populations using our feeders. Um, WBFI.org has a resource, resource page. Make sure to check it out. There are also some handouts um, that I believe are available in the, the webinar uh, platform. Um, so you can check those out as well. And you can check out my site. Uh, I've got uh, tips and tricks and, and uh, you know, ideas and reviews and things like that. So you can check that out. Allaboutbirds.org is just a great site to learn all about birds it's a great place and then obviously there's the national audubon society which is audubon.org so all great resources on continuing you know your growth of learning to ethically and safely feed birds as well as just learning about birds and we will have another webinar that's specific to learning to identify the birds at your feeders i believe that is next week so if you come back next week uh, we've got one on that so with that we'll go into questions um, i know we've got uh, at least Maybe one comment, so we'll look at that. If you have more questions, we'll take them now. Um, I'm gonna put up the contact information while we address questions. So contact information. Um, if you wanna contact WBFI.org, there is their contact information. Um, and then for myself, info at flockingaround.com, or uh, I also have a, a number, if you can write it down if you want, or we can throw it in the chat, is 307-313-BIRD. 307-313-BIRD. You can contact me there. Text, call, doesn't matter. I'll get back to you. If I don't answer, I'll get back to you. Um, it's just a one-man show over here. So, <clears throat> All right, questions. I think if I click on a question, it's going to immediately pull the screen down. So I'm going to give it another few seconds. You can screenshot this, write it down, whatever you need to do. I think it'll be shared also with you in a follow-up email. Um, so I'll leave it up. If you're, if you're an audience uh, watching the recorded version of this, please feel free. If there's a question we don't answer, use one of these, reach out to us, and we will do our best to answer your questions um, once we get them. All right, so if I click on a question, yep, it's gonna stop showing my screen. And here, while I answer questions, let's see if I can actually change to the feeders outside so we can. All right, there's a live look at my feeders. There's a butterfly flying around in between a couple of feeders right now. We'll see if any birds come in. Um, so you can see, I actually have a couple of my feeders on a wire suspension system because I have bear problems. Oh, do I have bear problems. Um, I thought uh, earlier this summer, I thought uh, I had an issue with some really big raccoons coming into my feeders because I, I had uh, some really big poles that got taken down. And uh, then I discovered the bear poo in my backyard. No, I, I had a bear problem. So I had to up, up the level a little bit, raise everything up. All right, let me go to questions here. So we've got, uh, let's see, someone from the PNW. Oh, a couple from the PNW, great. Okay, so question here from uh, Katie. Okay, feel like the dried fruit often gets eaten last or left in my feeder. Is it due to being low fat food versus seeds and nuts or are the birds species I'm feeding just not that into fruit? That's a great question. And honestly, I think you kind of answered it with, with either or. Um, high sugar foods are often used, you know, by forgivorous birds uh, at the early part of fall migration. So like robins right now, uh, bluebirds, things like that. They might be going crazy for the, you know, the, the high sugar foods and then they, they'll switch, you know, maybe later on. But also 
yeah, you know, fewer birds might just prefer those particular types of dried fruits. You might not, you know, have those in your area. Things like gross beaks will eat it, cardinals will eat it, uh, jays will sometimes eat it, you know, and then robins and bluebirds, but they don't eat it at all times of the year. And so it could also be a seasonality thing, but it, it's very possible just, yeah, maybe you don't have the species that prefer that dried fruit for your area. That's it's one of the things about, you know, learning the species you have in your area and the things that they prefer to eat, why it's uh, it's useful then for when you're putting out your, your feeders. We have other questions. I, I only see three. Does, Anyone else see any I'm missing? Okay, I see another one here. Um, it's asking if there's a certain type of food that squirrels won't invade as much. Great question. So squirrels generally are not fans of things like Niger. Um, they don't like safflower as much, although I've seen squirrels eat safflower too. Um, but, you know, it's less tasteful to them, so they might not eat the safflower as much. Um, you know, I've seen squirrels raid nectar feeders, um, but not very often. So generally, it's more out of curiosity. They'll spill it instead of, you know, trying to lick it all up. Um, so, you know, things like that, squirrels might not invade as much. But the, the main food types that are appreciated by birds, squirrels also love. Uh, but millet and milo, also, they're, they're just too small of a seed for the squirrels to want to invest their time into and not a high enough fat content or protein content that the squirrels really appreciate. You know, they, they like the oily uh, seeds especially. So um, milo and millet will attract things like jays and, and uh, sparrows, but squirrels not gonna go after those as much. They'll, they might spill them out, but they're, they're, uh, they're not gonna eat it up. Although spilling can be just as much of a pain in the hiney as, as squirrels just eating it all. Um, but we will talk about ways to mitigate against that, because there are some simple and easy ways to do that. You see, I've got squirrel baffles on uh, the mesh tube feeders in the webcam here. Hopefully you can see that. Um, you can see I've got some squirrel baffles that, uh, they're not foolproof, but the squirrels eat a lot less of the food when I have it, because it makes it a lot harder for them to function. And those are the only questions I'm seeing, Zach. Oh, nope, I see one more. Uh, what are some of the best tips and tricks to source quality bird seed? Just source quality bird seed. Um, so one one great way to do it is WBFI actually has um, a uh, and and maybe Emily, you or if Amazon, one of you wants to talk about it, um, is uh, a quality standard. So there's a quality standard that it's a it's a logo, it's a sticker. Um, it's used, you know, on, on sacks of seed that, you know, says specifically, you know, this, this meets a certain standard. Um, that's a great way to do it. Um, otherwise, it can be difficult to know, you know, if you're, if you're sourcing a quality seed. Um, so that's a great way to do it. And I don't know if that's on the resources page or on the quality standards. Maybe there's a quality standards page on the WBFI.org site. Um, yeah. Similarly, if you want to speak to that, maybe. Yep. I will drop that link in the comments right now. Perfect. Great question. All, All right. right, any location specific questions? You know, getting certain types of birds wherever you live, you know, um, it, because, you know, what attracts uh, a, a bird in the, in the East can be very different, even if it's the same species as what attracts a bird in the West, because, you know, subspecies can change bill sizes. So, you know, uh, a goldfinch in the east might have a smaller bill size than a goldfinch in the west based on the food types they eat. So if you have location specific questions, this is a, a great time to ask it. How about um, seasons? Is there a better time of year to feed birds than others? You know, all seasons are great to feed birds. It's about, you know, kind of adjusting the what you're feeding. Um, because like I said, a lot of birds are going to switch to insects during certain parts of the year. So you might see your feeder activity go lower. Um, so then maybe that's when you switch to the, the fruits that attract, you know, things like Orioles that will eat fruits in the summertime where, you know, maybe the chickadees aren't coming into suet as frequently. Um, you know, suet, not as great in the summer because sometimes it can melt unless you use like a suet dough or something. But still, a lot of the birds that use suet won't use it in the summertime. So adjusting what you're feeding 
it really depends on what you're trying to attract. Um, I don't put up hummingbird food in wintertime here in the Rocky Mountains, uh, but I do put up hummingbird feeders in the summer. So you know, considering what you're trying to attract uh, affects the season that you're feeding, but all seasons can be good for feeding birds. It just really depends on what birds you have in your area. Because you know, if you live on the top of a mountain in montane forest, you're not gonna be getting Orioles. So putting out oranges is not as useful for you Whereas maybe you get bluebirds, so putting out mealworms in the summertime is a great way to still ensure you're getting bluebirds and chickadees coming in. Um, so, you know, adjusting your, your feeding to the season is helpful. But I will say one of the best times to feed migration and in the wintertime, because in the winter, birds need uh, calories to keep warm, to keep their metabolism going. And then migration, obviously, well, the, the migratory birds, they need a constant influx of food to help fuel their movements. So, um, you know, for some birds, it's like they'll they'll eat as much as what would be the equivalent to us eating 27 cheeseburgers in a single day to help fuel, you know, one big leg of their migration. So they'll eat that much in a day. If you were to eat 27 cheeseburgers and gain all those calories, that's what they'll do in a day to ensure they can uh, make one leg of their journey. Wow. Thank you. And I'm not seeing any other questions here. Okay. Well, if you have more questions, uh, we've got the contact information out there. There will be a follow-up email. If you're watching this uh, recorded, then obviously, uh, if you want to register to be in the ambassador program, visit wbafi.org and visit the ambassador page. You can register there, and then you'll also get the follow-up emails, and you can register for the rest of the webinars um, that are coming up. Yes, and thank you guys so much for attending this webinar and a huge thanks to Zach for sharing his knowledge and better bird feeding practices. That was super interesting. Um, if any of you are interested in obtaining free bird feeding products or donating products to ambassadors, um, you have until Friday to do so and you can just complete one of these forms. I'll put the link here in the chat. There's a form for uh, product donations and a form for ambassadors. So just go ahead and complete those by Friday. Um, next week, like Zach said, we'll be learning about local birds. In that webinar, it will help match feeder and feed types to attract specific bird species and also learn about avian migration. Uh, make sure to follow flocking around in the WBFI on social media to stay in the know on upcoming webinars and events and be on the lookout for an email from WBFI with the next steps before we meet again next week. And finally, once logging off, there's going to be a short survey that will launch. Um, if you guys could complete that for us, we would appreciate it very much. And thanks again for being here and have a great night. Thanks everybody.